takes a sip of the beer and heads back toward the stairs. I pick up the bottle cap and throw it at her head. <laughs> Halfway up the stairs, she turns around, shakes up the bottle to spray me with the foam. It doesn't do anything but pour down the sides of the bottle, making a mess on the stairs. She puts her mouth over the bottle top to slurp it up. This one's for us, she says. I look up the stairs. Kevin gives me beer sometimes, she says. It's cool. So, Kevin is sitting in a webbed lawn chair next to the picnic table. Did he really forget he's still wearing shit and blood? I remember Daddy said you could tell a lot about a person by the state of his shoes. His are a mess. I'd like to know why he's home in the middle of the day, but I'm not going to ask. Whenever anyone ever showed up in the middle of the day at home, it was because he got canned. Angie motions for me to sit down. We sit across from each other at the picnic table. Char's got some nice roses, Kevin points at the trellis of white roses against the house. The roses are mostly dried up flower heads right now, but a few are still blooming, looking weird against the peely paint of the house. Char plants things in strict rows, one petunia, two petunia, lots of room between them. To me, all her plants look lonely. Kevin likes them. He won't shut up about the roses going on and on. You gotta be a goddamn expert to get roses that pretty, he says. Pretty. Just like you girls. And I mean it too. Me and Angie look at each other. We both sit up straighter. Kevin gets up off the lawn chair and it tips side to side before stopping upright. I barely see the knife come out of his pocket before he slices off four of Char's precious rose blooms. Not even a leaf or a petal falls, just four whole heads whacked off. Kevin, beer in one hand, knife in the other, looks at Angie in the eye, then he locks eyes with me. He whoops with laughter. I got something to show you. I don't dare move. He shows us the knife, a very skinny gray blade with a black plastic handle that says NSF in upraised letters. Given the state of Kevin's clothing, I'm surprised the knife is so clean. Just a hint of green stock on the blade where he chopped the roses. He handles the knife as if it's a valuable piece of jewelry, palms up so we can see it. The blade is permanently stained with what I'm sure are countless dead ducks. See, most people are scared of a knife right off, even more than a gun. Guns are a whole different class of hardware, he says. I, I wouldn't know about that. I'm pretty sure I'm scared of both about you both. <laughs> <laughs> Let me give you a demonstration. I close my eyes for a second. Is Jesus my savior? Body and blood cross my heart and hope to die. When I open them, Kevin shows us techniques interesting enough to forget about dying. One is, you hold the knife upright and slash. He slashes down through the air. That's how they butcher the ducks after they've been electrocuted. Electrocuted? We can't believe it. All this time we've been thinking Kevin killed them by wringing their necks. <laughs> Another way is to grip the knife with your palm, blade facing down. That's the way you normally murder somebody. <laughs> side to side gets you the most blood. Puncture the stomach to make a point. If you mean business, go for the jugular in the neck. Given the kind of trouble you're likely to find yourself in, maybe a boy is trying something on you, give him the side treatment. That way you'll draw blood. Get him scared, but not really hurt him too much. I slouch down at the picnic table, feeling my muscles give way. He wants to protect us, not murder us. He wants us to like him. So you can imagine where this is leading, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Libby learns something definitely weird is going on with her friend. And this next scene that I'm going to read is um, her 
first confrontation with a friend about it. And uh, there's a railroad tracks that you know runs uh, along the side of this uh, neighborhood. So this is a place that both of the girls go to for uh, sanctuary, I guess, if you can believe it. <laughs> um, the bushes at the tracks are sticking into my back, poking me when Angie finds me. I force myself to say hi. Nothing comes out, even after I open my mouth again. Dread rises in my throat. We watch the trains pass through like TV reruns. I scan the clacking cars, reading and counting. Santa Fe, Great Northern, Saskatchewan, Santa Fe, four, Santa Fe, five. Angie sits Indian style cross-legged with her eyes closed. She says, listen, listen to that. Trucks are driving down the street near the factories. The factories talk back. A kid's yell pops up from somewhere. A song from a radio flies out the window of a faraway car, speeding. The birds are going crazy. The wind is tossing things around on the tracks. Even though it still feels like summer, it seems as if a dusty rug has just been shaking out, choking the air. Angie's hair is blown by the wind, and she keeps pulling strands of it out of her mouth. She tells me, Nothing really happened between me and Kevin. Don't lie to me, Angie. She lifts her chin, picks at her fingernail polish. It's chipping off in spots. I take one of her hands and use my thumbnail to scrape some of it off. Angie says, Oh, Lippy, pulls her hand away. It doesn't come off that easy, I say. We rest together in the semi-shade of the bushes, flattening out the grass and brush. I notice Angie's got new sandals on. I still have my same flip-flops, but I did get a new bra after a comment after the sidewalk sale days. Angie pokes my chest with her finger. You know what? I think you're finally growing bigger titties now. <laughs> her hand presses my chest. I feel like I'm on that amusement ride where the flower drops out. The area around the tracks where we've been sitting seems to whirl past when I shut my eyes. I open my eyes and look at the ragged red polish on Angie's fingernails jabbing my breastbone. That hurts, I say. And she sits up straighter and puts her arm around me. Her touch is warm. Libby, she says. She pushes some sweaty hair off my forehead. I feel my lips turn down, but I won't cry. Angie touches my cheek. We sit there closely in silence, neither of us moving. We are both holding our nail-bitten hands in our laps. Angie says she thinks she might want Kevin. Do you mean, like, your boyfriend? I think about Angie and her stepdad together. No way, I say. It's not like we're related. Silence slams into my chest. Have you guys done it, I ask? Shocked and also jealous. Well, not all the way, she says, but they've done other things. I think about the reproduction movie and the fashionable teacher who said it was important to use the right words. With this penis, I ask? Angie nods. He asked her to. He also touched other places. Somehow I knew it. I always sort of knew it. She tells me that some of the stuff he did felt good. He tells me I'm special. I feel a hum come up through my body, a vibration from head to toe. Before I came to Rubberville, I remember we passed by towns on the highway and Daddy would say about the small ones, blink and you miss it. Things in this world can be that small or that big. I don't blink at all when she tells me how it started. 